Hey, I am so excited to be able to introduce a whole new month of Woven with you. I know this is not our normal dynamic, but I am thrilled for how your thread groups are gonna continue to grow and cultivate community in Christ together. Our Woven Woman for the month of October is Hannah. We'll find her in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Some of you may be familiar with her story. I know my friends who have babies or are trying to have babies or wish they had babies all love Hannah's story. But I got to be honest, as a girl who doesn't have babies and is not dreaming about them, I am tremendously encouraged by Hannah's story. Why do I say that? Because my prayer is that wherever you find yourself today, that you hear the word of the Lord, that as you hear Hannah's story, you find your own in it and you see what God is working in your life. And so if you'll join me, we're gonna be reading from the New International Version in 1 Samuel chapter one, starting in verse one. If you're familiar with the rhythm of woven, you know that I invite you to enjoy story time, to just listen to the word of God as we prepare to spend a month in Hannah's story. You know, so much of the Bible was originally intended to be heard in the context of community. And I pray that you get that experience in your thread group today. So in 1 Samuel chapter 1, starting in verse 1, there was a certain man from Ramatam, a Zuphite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other, Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than 10 sons? Her husband Elkanah asked. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up before the Lord. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk and said to her, how long are you gonna stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my Lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they arose and worshiped before the Lord, and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. When her husband Elkanah went up with all his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and to fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. 
She said to her husband, After the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. Do what seems best to you, her husband Elkanah told her. Stay here until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. So the woman stayed home and nursed her son until she had weaned him. After he was weaned, she took the boy with her, young as he was, along with a three-year-old bull, an ephah of flour, and a skin of wine, and brought him to the house of the Lord at Shiloh. When the bull had been sacrificed, they brought the boy to Eli. And she said to him, Pardon me, my Lord, as surely as you live, I am the woman who stood here beside you, praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Then Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. My mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. Do not keep talking so proudly or let your mouth speak such arrogance. For the Lord is a God who knows, and by him deeds are weighed. The bows of the warriors are broken, but those who stumbled are armed with strength. Those who were full hire themselves out for food, but those who were hungry are hungry no more. She who was barren has borne seven children, but she who has had many sons pines away. The Lord brings death and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and raises up. The Lord sends poverty and wealth. He humbles and he exalts. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap. He seats them with princes and has them inherit a throne of honor. For the foundations of the earth are the Lord's. On them, he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful servants, but the wicked will be silenced in the place of darkness. It is not by strength that one prevails. Those who oppose the Lord will be broken. The Most High will thunder from heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Then Elkanah went home to Ramah, but the boy ministered before the Lord under Eli, the priest. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. Then they would go home. And the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. Now, I know that was such a long story, but it's so good, and I want to give you some background that might be helpful. First off, monogamy was not the only incorrect option at this time. So yes, Elkanah does have two wives. Hannah was his first wife. Penina was his second. Hannah was not able to have children, as we know. So it's likely that Elkanah took Penina as his wife to be able to give him children. You know, Hannah's name actually means charming and attractive, whereas Penina's name means fertile and prolific. So that's probably what happened. Nevertheless, this family goes to worship God at Shiloh year after year, making sacrifices. And while it is kind of Elkanah to give Hannah a double portion of meat that she really didn't deserve because she didn't have any kids, at the same time, it just made Hannah that much more aware of the fact that she was different. It made her that much more aware of what she didn't have. And if she missed it, Penina consistently provoked her Scripture says she severely provoked her to the point that Hannah was weeping bitterly, to the point that Hannah couldn't even eat. Hannah was already well aware of what she didn't have and that she wanted. It was so important to have kids in those days, to pass on your inheritance, to pass on your legacy. 
And Hannah couldn't provide that. But to be provoked, to be made fun of, to be put down and shamed because of that. Year after year, her family went to worship God at Shiloh. And year after year, she was reminded of what God seemed to be withholding from her. How she just wasn't quite enough. And I think her husband means well when he says, why are you crying? Am I not more to you than ten sons? But do you notice he's kind of more focused on how he feels than she does? Isn't she worth more than ten sons, I wonder? But what does Hannah do with all of this? All of these questions, all of this pain? She prays to the Lord. If you catch anything about Hannah today, I pray that it's that. Hannah prays to the Lord. Hannah loves to talk with God. In every moment, in every circumstance, she comes before God in prayer. And so as she's weeping bitterly, we see in verse 10 of chapter 1, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. I love that the fact that Hannah prays is sandwiched between her weeping and her distress. That God delights in our weeping in our distress. Who else on earth is like that? Do you never, you never tire him. Do you know that? He never gets tired of you. You're never too much for him to handle. He knows the cries of your heart. In fact, I would argue it hurts God even more than it hurts us because he's a good father. He's the best. So Hannah, in the midst of her weeping, in the midst of her distress, she prays to God. She carries it all to him. And she promises, listen to what she says in verse 11. She made a vow saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son, then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life. Do you notice when she says, remember me, that's the only time she says me. All three of her other requests, she's referring to herself in the third person as a servant of the Lord. But how does she feel? She says, if you would just look, if you would just remember, if you would not forget, and if you would give. Hannah doesn't feel seen by God right now. She feels forgotten. She feels neglected. She wonders, what's your plan for my life? But even in that place, she still calls on the God who is able. She still believes that he hears her cry and he will answer in his way, in his time. She still believes he's worth her time and he's worthy of her making such a promise to him. Maybe that's you. Maybe you feel like God doesn't see you. Maybe you feel like God has forgotten about you, that God is withholding something from you. Be encouraged that God sees you. God cares about you. God has a plan for you that we can't always see right now. But cry out to him in your distress. Cry out to him in your weeping. Cry out to him in your questioning, in your sadness. He wants it all. Do you believe he's listening? And do you believe he will answer? I pray you do. So verse 12, as she kept on praying to the Lord, notice that theme. Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. I've got to imagine that as much as Hannah felt unseen by God, she felt unheard by the world. Even so, she is heard before God our Father. She has a voice before him. We were just talking about prayer. So often we talk about prayer as us talking to God, but God is listening to us attentively. He's sitting and delighting in our voice. We have weight and value. Our voice is heard before the God of all creation. Who is like our God? He already knows even before a word is on our lips, he knows it all together, but he sits and so excited to talk with us and to listen at any hour, at any state, in all occasions. She may not be heard by the world, by Eli. She may not be heard by Panina. She may not be heard by Elkanah. But you better believe she's heard before the Lord our God. It's powerful. 
So Eli thought she was drunk. And he says, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. You know, I'm not going to spend too long on this. But I really wonder, what was Eli's prayer life like at this moment in time? That here she was in the temple of the Lord, no less, broken, crying out to God. And rather than assuming she's praying, Eli's first assumption is that she's drunk. Praise God that the assumptions of other people is not what ever defines us. But God does. The one who knows our heart, he knows yours. So she graciously corrects him. Not so, my Lord. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I haven't been drinking. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. You see, she's not filling herself with wine or spirits, but she's pouring herself out before God, believing that he will fill her with his self. She says, do not take your servant for a wicked woman. Other translations say a worthless woman. You can imagine how she might have felt that way in that moment. Worthless. It's not who she is. She says, I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Other translations say she's been praying out of her great anxiety. I feel like that lands with us today. That in the moment of greatest anxiety, greatest pain, greatest grief, greatest doubt, greatest sorrow, she cries out to God. She prays out of that. Do you get that? She doesn't pray it away. She prays out of it. She takes it all to God. Our God who asks us to cast every one of our cares upon him because he cares for us. This is what prayer looks like. This is what a relationship with God looks like. Do we pray out of our greatest anxiety and grief? Even when we don't have the words, just the groaning, just the cries of our heart, God wants all of that. It's nobody else like him. So I think Eli's a little bit embarrassed. <laughs> he says, go in peace. May God grant you what you've asked. And she's kind again. May your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went her way, and her face was no longer downcast. Other translations say her countenance was sad no longer. Now here is what strikes me about that. At this point in the story, nothing has changed about Hannah's circumstances. They are the exact same as they have been year after year after year. And yet, her countenance was sad no longer. Her face was no longer downcast. Could it be that God wants to do that for you? Maybe you feel like God doesn't see your sadness. Maybe you're just waiting for your circumstances to change so that you don't have to feel quite so sad anymore. I know that's my story. To be really honest with you, over the last two years, I've been more sad than I have ever been in my life, and I really can't figure it out. And I am desperately crying out for God to change my circumstances, and they're not. But what if God wants to heal my sadness from the inside out before my circumstances change? What a testimony to who God is, that even when it seems like there's no reason for great joy, there is, because God is more than enough. Because I can look to him, still feeling sadness, but choosing to delight, choosing to rejoice, choosing to hope in the God who is able, to hope in my God who is more than enough. If he did it for Hannah, why can't he do it for me? If he can do it for Hannah, why can't he do it for you? Her countenance was sad no longer, even before the story changed. But listen, the story does change. I believe that we worship and serve and believe in a God who has the power to change our stories. But will we find joy in him even before it does? He's so worthy of it. So early the next morning, verse 19, they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. So you see, Hannah still believes God is worthy of worship. I'm just astounded by this woman. This woman, this real woman, okay? Not just a character in a story that we read about, but somebody like you and me. Look at the way that she relies on God in prayer. And he always shows up for her. So when they go home, she sleeps with her husband. She gets pregnant with Samuel. God answers her prayer. And so the next year when the family goes up to worship God at Shiloh, as they always do, Hannah holds back. She's not withholding Samuel from God as she promised. She says, wait till he's weaned, then I'll bring him. And she does. She goes up to Shiloh when Samuel is still small, her first and only child after being childless 
for so long. And she offers him. You see in 27, she's talking to Eli. She's remember, reminding him who she is. And she says, I prayed for this child and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. Verse 28, so now I give him to the Lord. Y'all, she could have stopped there, but she doesn't. What does she say? So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he will be given over to the Lord. I think that's powerful because that language is continual. Just like Hannah continued in prayer before God, Hannah now promises to continue to offer up Samuel, her son, to God throughout his whole life. And she leaves him there to be raised under Eli the priest in the house of the Lord, as she vowed to do before God. Can you imagine that goodbye? I can't. I try, but I can't. This woman who has longed for kids for so long finally gets one and now leaves her son in the hands of God. What does she do at what I would argue is the most painful and difficult moment of her entire life? Well, she prays, of course. <laughs> Isn't that what Hannah does? Isn't that the rhythm that she's established in her life? It's foundational. Who would she go to but God? There is no other. So she leaves Samuel in the house of the Lord. And chapter 2 begins by saying Hannah prayed. And this is known as Hannah's song. It's powerful. I just was meeting with a thread group leader this past weekend who was telling me about a prayer room that she has that she calls her war room. That fighting happens on our knees so much in the kingdom of God. But she has this chapter two right up in her war room to read over and over in the presence of God. So note that Hannah is praying. She just left her son Samuel in the house of the Lord. And what's the first thing she prays? My heart rejoices in the Lord. What? She doesn't say that her heart rejoices in her baby boy. Her heart rejoices in the Lord. Greater than any gift God could ever give us is God himself. Would we hold fast to the greatest gift, the greatest one? My heart rejoices in the Lord. In the Lord, my horn is lifted high. Horn symbolizes strength. So her joy comes from God and her strength comes from God. She knows it. That's how she can do all these things that she's doing. She says, my mouth boasts over my enemies, for I delight in your deliverance. That she can boldly stand before what comes against her and tries to take her out because she rejoices in God, because she delights in him. Do you know that the joy of the Lord really is our strength? It doesn't just sound pretty. She just left her son and she's rejoicing in the Lord. She continues, she says, there is no one holy like the Lord. I've said it so many times, but you got to keep in mind where she is when she's saying this. There is no one holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There's no rock like our God. I love how that word you is in there in verse two. Feel free to mark it if you're reading with me. There is no one besides you. See, she's making these declarations of who God is. And I think she's kind of telling herself who God is, helping herself believe it when it's really hard to believe. But to say there's no one besides you, that's personal. That's a language of prayer. That's a language of a relationship. And the words that she's saying, she just left what she prayed for, her baby boy. And she's saying there's no one besides you, God. There never has been. There never will be. You're my all in all. You're my all sufficient. You're everything. There's no one holy like you. There's no rock like our God. You're my strength. So she says, the Lord is a God who knows. Isn't that beautiful? The Lord is a God who knows. He knows our hurts. He knows our sorrows, but he also know what's, knows what's coming. We can trust him. He's already there. And every single season of our life matters. Every single question, every single fear, every single hurt, every single sadness, every bit of suffering is never wasted in the kingdom of God. He knows. 
He's arming us for what's ahead, for the battle ahead. He's preparing us to walk in the fullness of his calling on our life. He knows. Praise God we worship a God who knows and still loves us. She says, those who stumble, they're armed with strength. Don't you know that's her story? In the presence of God, she finds her strength. She declares it when she says, it's not by strength that one prevails. How is it that we prevail? By the grace of God. How do we come to know the grace of God? In his presence and in prayer, in relationship. That's what he asks of us. Nothing more and nothing less than a real ongoing relationship with him. What a beautiful invitation. So it says that Samuel ministers before the Lord under Eli the priest. So many times I think we think about God ministering to us. But what would it look like if we ministered to God? I feel like it might look a little bit like Hannah praying before the Lord. And isn't it cool that Hannah was ministering before the Lord before Samuel was even born? As she cried out to God in her distress. As she cried out to God those nine months that he was growing within her. And as she was raising him before she left him in the house of the Lord. And even after she left, she continues to cry out to God interceding for her son, ministering to the Lord. You see, Samuel was a part of ministering to the Lord before he was even in that official role. His mom taught him. Before Eli taught him, his mom taught him. I don't know who needs to hear that today, that in your home, you're the first person to teach your kids the way of Jesus. You're the first person to disciple your kids, to teach them how to minister to God and to one another. It matters. I'm so thankful that's my story. If I were to share my whole story of how I came to know Jesus and the journey since with you, I always begin by saying I first experienced the love of Jesus through my parents and how they loved one another and me and my two brothers. So the love of God was never something I had to buy into or be convinced of. Rather, it was something I knew and was familiar with. I'm so thankful. I feel like my mom's story parallels Hannah's in so many ways. You see, I have an older brother and a younger brother, but before the three of us were born, my parents miscarried. I can't imagine losing a baby you never even got to meet in the first place. They go to the doctor and the doctor tells my mom, you're never gonna be able to have kids. Gosh, they already had a broken heart and now they're told that they're never gonna be able to hold a kid of their own. So mom and dad are driving home from the doctor, grieving in deep anguish, right? And they pull over to the side of the road. What do they do? They pray to the Lord. And they say, God, we always knew that children were a gift from you, but now we're convinced of it. If you choose to give us the gift of children, we promise to entrust their lives completely to you. They're yours not ours. And every time mom and dad found out they were pregnant with my older brother, me, and my younger brother, mom and dad prayed to the Lord. They said, God, we remember the promise. They're your kids, not ours. Y'all, I am fully convinced that it is because of the prayers of my parents before all of us were born and each day of our lives since that me and my two brothers not only know Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, but all of us have been affirmed in our call to serve God in gospel ministry. Why? Such grace upon grace. Thank God for the prayers of my parents. Thank God that my parents didn't believe what the doctor said because they believed in the God who was able to do far more abundantly beyond all we could ever ask or imagine according to his power at work within us. I had parents who believed long before me. I have parents who believe for me, and I'm so thankful that they've taught me that way of relationship with God, that I pray I teach others. Y'all, wherever you are in life, you have this amazing opportunity to pave the way for those coming after you in prayer. God hears, and he's sure to answer. So every year, Hannah returns 
as they always did, right? Going to Shiloh, making the offerings. And isn't it sweet that every year she makes a new robe for her son Samuel, right? He's growing. He needs some new clothes. And so it's so sweet that she gets to see her son each year, but isn't it also sad? Don't you wish, think she wished she could have seen him that whole year in between? Goodness, little kids grow so much in a year. I'm sure she wished she could have seen it every day, but she hopes in the Lord. She goes back to worship him year after year. He's still worthy of it. And then this story ends by saying that the Lord is gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. Meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. See, Hannah couldn't have kids. She ended up having six. Who but our God can do that? God saw that coming all along, but isn't it gracious that before Hannah had any kids, before her circumstance changed, when she was in the middle of grief, God knew the end of the story, but he didn't rush there. He met her in the middle. He grieved with her. He heard her cry. Though he knew the hope of what was coming, he supplied her with the hope she needed to endure, to believe, to keep standing. How did Hannah fight on her knees before God in prayer? Do we? Do you? You're going to have time in your thread group tonight to be able to talk about how you see your story and Hannah's story. And I pray that you feel the freedom to be really real with one another. What one of you might have to say to the other could be the most important thing that somebody hears tonight, far beyond anything you've heard from me. But I'm so excited to get to spend this whole month in Hannah's story. I pray it's an encouragement to you, and I pray it encourages others through you as you come to know this story for yourself that you might share hope with those who are not a part of this yet. Will you pray with me? God, I thank you for who you are. As Hannah declared, there's no one holy like you. There's no one like our God. You are the rock on which we stand. You're our strength and our defender, and you're not far from the brokenhearted. You're near. You supply us with every bit of hope that we need to endure, to believe, to keep walking by faith and not by sight. God, help us believe that you are worthy of trust. Bring us into a place that we can pray out of our greatest anxieties that we can pour out our hearts before you in deep distress and weeping, knowing that you're gonna fill us with yourself, knowing that you listen closely and attentively, the God of all creation, you hold the whole universe in your hands and yet you are actively ready, waiting and wanting to hear from us just as we are. God, I don't understand your love, but I'm so grateful for it. And I pray I live my whole life in response to that love, loving you right back and loving the world. And I pray that for my sisters and thread groups across Dallas this week. I pray that your Holy Spirit will illuminate your word of truth for us, light the way before us, and would we have the courage to follow you knowing that we are never alone. Amen.